Thank you very much. I want to begin with a very, very warm 40th year greeting to EcoFarm. In, you know, in today's world, 40 years is a very long time <laughs> to sustain an institution and movement that long. Um, and it's even more important because what EcoFarm carries in it, and I noticed between the last time I was here, which was in 2002, I think, uh, and now, all the new dimensions of the movement are here at EcoFarm. And anything living evolves, adapts, diversifies. Anything colonizing stunts evolution, or thinks it can, because look at what the Roundup Ready crops did. It has given you super resistant super weeds, because you can't really shut evolution down, no matter how much you imagine you're engineering the world. We have two clear paths for food and farming, for the future, that vision. We are not the only ones having a vision. Those who brought us to the brink also have a vision of how, will they, will, how they will continue the colonization, their projects of extinction, their projects of domination, their projects of profits at any cost. As long as humans have been around, and we've been around 200,000 years as species, we have eaten. <laughs> and the early forest uh, hunter-gatherers ate what the forest gave. But even today, in my land in India, there are tribal communities whose 80% of the food comes from the forest. I'm going to be doing a big festival. We do around the 1st of October to celebrate Gandhi's birth anniversary. We do an annual earth festival, we call it Bhumi. And this we're going to dedicate it to Sita of the earth, because she was born of the earth. And, um, and she spent most of her life as an exile in the forest. So we're going to celebrate with forest foods, including the plants we don't grow that feed us in our fields if you don't spray Roundup. On our farm at Navdanya in Dehradun, we have um, wild edible parties. And we can go, just go around and collect about 20 plants that are edible. They're also healing plants. And they're usually far more nutritious than the cultivated plants. So from the time we've been around, we're eating. We have one way or the other produced our food. And we've evolved thousands of ways of farming according to our climates, according to our ecosystems. And our cultures are a reflection of the diversity of the land and our histories. But this path of, the f of food and farming, which is distilled in the movements that are present here, shares three common principles, which you can't work against. The first is the principle of diversity. Nature does not work on the principle of sameness and uniformity and monocultures. The natural world is constantly evolving and striving for diversity of expression. So it was one grass, Oriza Sativa, that gave us the rice. And in India, the indigenous peasants evolved 200,000 rice varieties. The rice scientist who did this work is the one I called on to teach me about seed when I realized I had to save seeds, realizing that here were corporations 
that wanted to own and control the seed through genetic engineering, patenting, and laws that would make it illegal for farmers to save seeds. Since we are here in Asilomar, I wonder how many of you know that when the techniques of being able to splice genes and move them across species boundaries were created through recombinant DNA, the scientists who had worked on those techniques gathered here in Asilomar, 1972, and said, we know how to do it, but we do not know what it will do. We don't know the implications, so we call a moratorium on recombinant DNA. The scientists called for a moratorium. The money makers ran with it. And before GMO started, we were warning that biodiversity will be impacted. We were warning farmers will be impacted. We have seen, just in these 25 years, the disappearance of the monarch butterfly. I have witnessed in my country 400,000 farmers suicide. But India's not the only country, if you look closely, farmers suicides are very high in the United States, very high in Australia, extremely high in Europe, much higher than the normal rate. How could it be that we reduced the people who provide food you know, to such a distress that they are driven to suicide? The second principle is the law of return. Most of you, it's an organic farming conference. Most of you are organic farmers. I wonder how many of you know of the origins of the modern contemporary organic farming movement. So in 1905, the British sent to India an imperial economic botanist. They didn't have a discipline called agriculture in those days. It was economic botany on how to make money out of agriculture and agricultural commodities. After all, the first empire was an empire of cotton. And that's where the idea of growing just one commodity started. The empire of cotton needed this land colonized and the land taken away from indigenous people. It needed people captured in Africa to be brought here as slaves, to work in the cotton fields. It needed India to be enslaved so that we could not grow our own food for, to feed ourselves. That was the period of the great famines. We lost 60 million people to famines by the extractive economy of the empire, beginning with the East India Company. We were forced to grow indigo for the cotton empire, while the farmers starved. In that period of 1905, Howard is sent to us to make the empire stronger. And he arrives in Bihar, which is exactly the state where the indigo cultivation was creating a slavery system. But in areas where indigo wasn't grown, which is where he arrived in Pusa, he finds the soils are fertile and there's no pest damage to the crops. And he says, I can do no better than make the Indian peasant and the pest my professor, to learn what good farming is. He studied under the insects and the Indian peasants and wrote a book called The Agricultural Testament, which has been published in this country by Rodale, uh, by Soil Association in UK, and we have editions in India. But it was one last remaining copy that I found in the library while doing my work on the Green Revolution that gave me these principles. He says, in India, they farm like nature. They f the farming is as perennial as that of the forest and the ocean because of diversity and the law of return, of giving back of constantly giving back. That's what in contemporary language is now being called the circular economy. 
in ecological systems, it's maintaining the ecosystems through maintaining the nutrient cycles and maintaining the water cycles. If you maintain those two cycles, we'll be fine. Even climate change is a rupture of the nutrient cycle. Because with the ability to mine fossilized coal at that time, because the empire was helped with fossil fuels, the internal combustion, you know, you, they could have had all the slaves, they could have had all the land, and if they were still hand spinning and hand weaving in England, they couldn't have taken over the world. It was the internal combustion engine. It was coal. And the mining of coal through slavery in England that allowed the takeover, that allowed this limitless appetite of not giving, just taking. I know what it did to my land. We used to be, you know, we, we were the land that had all the spices and wonderful fabric and textiles. We accounted for 25% of the world economy. That's why Christopher Columbus was actually coming to India for the spices and the textiles. And he had no idea that there was land in between. And he, in, you know, he actually lost his way. And so he has named all the indigenous cultures of this land Indians. But Indians really is a, a word for colonized people. But we can rise in our solidarity and reclaim our diversities. The East India Company was created because the British got jealous and said, oh my gosh, the Spanish are making so much money out of the Americas. So they created the East India Company, and the corporation was born through the East India Company. There was nothing like a corporation before that. We assume they've always been around. Trade has been around. Business has been around. But all business has been accountable to communities, to the land, to the earth. Unaccountable business with no liability or limited liability was created by 300 merchant adventurers who got the queen to sign a charter, go conquer. Go colonize. And if the civilizing mission in the Spanish conquest was religion, the civilizing mission for the British conquest was the new religion of making money. Just the fact that you could loot gave you the right to kill. And it gave you the right to not give back. The entire economics based on rent collection, where those who do nothing walk away with the gifts that the earth's work created, that nature's work creates, that people's work creates, and they assign to themselves the power of creation. The fact that I have fought against the idea of patenting life, which means life is invented, is because it's the ultimate arrogance of saying the seed is not creative, the seed does not reproduce, the seed does not multiply. Farmers who bred the 200,000 rice varieties in India or the 1,000 corn varieties in the corn countries, that they don't have minds. They didn't breed. So when you shoot a gene through, blindly through genetic engineering, you then can have intellectual property on the seed and collect rents. At the time of colonialism, the rent collection was for land. And it was brutal. It was brutal because the land was not owned by indigenous cultures. We've never believed in private property. But we had title through nature of caring for the land. It was not a tradable title. It was not of property. But we worked the land. We cared for the land. And we had a right to the land. Very often, the customary rights were collective rights of collective duties to how we'll manage our water, the crops we'll grow so we don't harm each other. 
When the British came to India, they just grabbed the land. And then the peasant whose land it was now had to pay rent. It used to be called Lagan. That's what created the poverty. That's what created the starvation. That's what created the famines. The result I mentioned was 60 million deaths. The last big famine was 1942, Great Bengal Famine. It isn't that there was lack of rice. We'd grown enough rice. It was extracted to be taken out as a tax collection. And more trade took place in the year of famine than before. Amartya Sen, our Nobel laureate, has written an entire book on this, that it wasn't lack of rice that led to the famine of 1942, but it was the greed of the empire. And women came out and started an amazing movement called the Bhaga, and we need an equivalent everywhere in the world now, where they said, Jan Debo Dhan Debo Na, we will give our lives, we will not give you our rice. That 1942 movement became known then as the Quit India Movement, telling the British Empire, time for you to quit. And eventually in 1947, they had to. It is time for us to tell the, the fossil fuel empire, the empire of the poison cartel. I was told they're meeting three miles away to sell more pesticides. And then just two hours away, you have Silicon Valley, which is joining hands with the poison cartel for the next colonization. The law of return is the only way we will have sustainability when we give back to the earth. The law of return is the only way we'll have justice when we recognize the gifts and work. Now, you know, I feel very grateful that I did not study economics and I did not study agriculture. I studied quantum theory. Because look at the insanity of saying economics is capital which creates, see on the top, the bottom of the pyramid is L for la labor and L for land, which are inert inputs. So the whole issue of return on investments the whole issue of capital accumulation comes from this illusion of extraction where you take what nature gives, you take what people create, and make it into the miracle creation of value by the robber. And we have reached exactly where we were in the 30s, where the rule of the robber barons had created such deep inequality in this country that a handful of people control the entire economy, led to the Great Depression. We have a handful of robber barons now. There are literally five billionaires that have as much wealth as half of humanity. And it's growing so fast, the wealth. And if you look at where is their wealth coming from, do they work? No, they don't. They just collect rents. They collect rents from money, our money. They collect rents from our minds. What does Facebook do? You exchange messages. They extract, they mine data from your Facebook messages. That extracted data is then sold on either to corporations to sell you things or through Cambridge Analytica to political parties. So you get an artificial intelligence president. <laughs> One of the issues that has preoccupied me deeply is the fact that an extractive economy has brought the earth and humanity to the brink. Every major international treaty, whether it be the Convention on Biological Diversity or it be the International, uh, in, the, um, international Biodiversity Con Convention, they're all warning that the rate at which we are disrupting the planet's systems, 
we could in a hundred years go extinct as a species by destroying the conditions of human life on Earth. The IPCC has said we've got a 10-year window to shift. So I would add in the 2020 vision a 10-year transition using all our diversity but constantly making sure that our diversity synergize to be able to deal with the robber barons and the poison cartel. I've done a new book called Oneness Versus the One Percent, and it is available from New Internationalist. I saw it was available in the bookstore yesterday when I did book signing. And while doing the book, I want you to understand two phenomena. In Paris, Bill Gates was strutting around on the stage with heads of state. I said, since when did a billionaire become a head of state? And then I realized he's taken over all the heads of state. He runs our policies. He runs the education policy of the state, which is now based on a new economics called zero budgeting. Cut the cost. He doesn't want teachers in schools. He wants computers. He wants e-learning because teachers cost. And e-learning brings him a rent on Microsoft programs. We've just had, just before I was leaving, the, you know, it used to be Bill Gates, the richest man, and then one year it became Jeff Bezos, and then he's back again. Uh, Jeff Bezos was strutting around my country because we are the biggest diversified markets. You turn any corner, you've got three people selling on a push card, five little hawker shops. India is a big market of tiny bazaars and tiny hearts. And Jeff Bezos wants it, you know. He began with destroying publishing and bookstores. Now he wants our food. And he managed to get an agreement with our government that Alexa, you know, Alexa is what they call the personal assistant, that Alexa would teach our kids in schools what is eating right. So I immediately, I was leaving for here, but I announced, I said, when I come back, I'm going to do a campaign. Amma, which means mother or grandmother or our indigenous ancestors. Amma, not Alexa. <laughs> We're going to learn what's eating right and what's good farming from our mothers and grandmothers and our great grandmothers. And that's why as part of our Earth University, which we run at Navdanya, um, and you can find out more about it by visiting the navdanya.org website. One of the courses we have is grandmother's universities. As long as we can remember. As long as we can remember, we will have power. As Milan Kundera said, the struggle of people against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And you talked about the memory of the land. There's memory of the seed. There's memory in every cell of our bodies. There is memory even when we are displaced. So the third principle of the path of justice and sustainability is sharing the earth's gifts in the commons, knowing that seed is a commons, land is a commons, water is a commons, the air we breathe is a commons. Knowledge is a commons. Food is a commons. Nourishment is a commons. Democracy is a commons. Reclaiming the commons has to be a very big part of our work in these times where enclosures of the commons and privatization of the common good is the way the other path has been shaped. So I mentioned the beginning of the other path is colonialism and the empire of cotton. This then was accelerated with the finding of oil and fossil fuels, which then led to the creation of chemicals connected to the project of extermination 
in Hitler's concentration camps. There used to be a cartel called IG Farben. IG Farben was given the task of making gases to kill people in the concentration camps. Standard Oil, which was the monopoly on oil in this country, had a joint partnership. It was called Standard Oil IG Farben. Standard Oil gave the money, Standard Oil gave the um, uh, fossil fuels. And the German industries basically created the technologies to kill. They were tried in Nuremberg. The Nuremberg trials were on the poison cartel. And the human rights laws flew out of that. But today we've totally forgotten that human rights has something to do this, with this group of companies which has only one gift, the gift to kill, the gift to exterminate. And that continues the colonial empire, which was based on extermination. 90% of the indigenous people of the Americas were made extinct. So now when we think of the six mass extinction, I always remind people, it's not just happening, it is designed. It was first designed for humans, and now it's affecting insects. It's affecting the bees and the butterflies. And it could affect the entire species if we don't change our path. I woke up to the damages of the poison cartel in 1984 when Punjab, where I had studied and done my MSc honors in physics, erupted in violence. It had been a very peaceful, very prosperous land. 84, 4th of June, war. Same year, 2nd of December, 1984, the city of Bhopal had a pesticide plant leak. Thousands were killed. Those two events forced me to look at why were we doing agriculture in ways that killed thousands. And I was seeking a non-violent way. I had no idea then that there were so many schools there was permaculture, and there was organic farming, and there was biodynamic, and there was natural farming. We now call all of these systems agroecology. And there is now a new attempt to attack these systems that work with the earth. It is based on that zero budget logic that Gates is using, that other companies are using to cut all costs and make 100% profits. And it has been launched in India, zero budget farming, financed $3 billion by the Black Rocks, the big investment funds, and to link the tiniest of peasants to Walmart and the global system. To Bill Gates and his ownership over seeds, now through digital technologies. So if Monsanto tried to take patents through genetic engineering, Bill Gates wants patents through just genomic reading. All you do, you know, it's a bit like colonialism was based on mapping. All you do is draw a line. And you draw a line through the territories and say, this is ours. And as it was said in the, uh, in the period of the British colonialism by one of the colonizers, we came with a sword in one hand and a yardstick in the other. Just make a yardstick, say, mine. And that's what's happening at the genomic level, where life itself is being enclosed. Earlier, we were told in the Green Revolution that we would starve if we did not have chemicals. Hunger grew, and chemicals stopped working. Then they came with GMOs and the myth that GMOs will feed us. Bees disappeared, peasants disappeared, Biodiversity in our fields disappeared. We grow lots and lots and lots of GMO corn and soya, 90% of which goes for animal feed and biofuel. It's not a food system. And even though it's called intensive, there's nothing intensive about it, except intensive in fossil fuels, intensive in chemicals, intensive in capital, which traps the farmer in debt and becomes a way of taking the land away. 
and the huge concentration of land, not in the hand of land owners anymore, in the hand of those same investment banks, same investment firms that got the farmer into debt. There's a huge transfer of land taking place to the financial giants. And the financial giants are merging with the biotechnology giants and the poison cartel, and they're merging with the information technology giants. If you look at the top 10 billionaires, they're either rent collectors from money or rent collectors from information. If this agriculture was intensive, it was used little amounts of land, it would not need to invade the Amazon and burn it. The burning of the Amazon is partly related to the fact that there's a trade war going on between China and US, and China is now buying from Brazil. And the Amazon is having to be cut. And on 26th, it says tomorrow, on the 26th of January is our Republic Day, and sadly, Bolsonaro is the chief guest and the protests growing in my country. Um, we wouldn't need to be invading new lands constantly. We wouldn't be needing to turn farmers into refugees. Our friends from Mexico talked about refugees. Ever since colonialism started, uprooting people from their homes has been the method. And the refugee crisis is the latest in this. I've done studies on Africa. I've done studies on Syria. It is the drought induced by intensive, sustainable, uh, unsustainable agriculture and commodity production that has dried up Lake Chad, that ran the wells dry in Syria, that is desertifying water-rich areas in the Americas, and people are being forced to leave their homes. Half of Syria is a refugee. And I say, if we don't turn things around, 90% of humanity will either be in detention centers or refugee camps under blue plastic. But we've got to return home because the earth is waiting for us. She's inviting us. And she's saying, you can be my healers. That is what is needed because 80% of the food we eat today in spite of a century of assault, 80% food comes from small farms, which use only 25% of the land, 25% of the resources. 20% comes from those giant farms that are becoming bigger and unmanageable and are the excuse for the next level of concentration. And they don't give you food because food is supposed to nourish you. Food isn't supposed to destroy your health. This morning at breakfast, we were sitting with someone who works in the Cancer Coalition, and she said one in three Americans has cancer. 85,000 cases of cancer have sued Monsanto, now buyer. 85,000 cases. In the first four cases, they had already lost $63 billion which was the equivalent of the money they had spent on buying Monsanto. So in fact, Monsanto is zero value right now. <laughs> and in 87, when these companies were saying, we've got to own the seed through genetic engineering and have international intellectual property treaties. And I said, but you don't invent the seed. Seed is not a machine. They had talked about five companies controlling food and health by the turn of the century. It's a cartel of four. Bayer has merged with Monsanto, Dow has merged with DuPont, Syngenta has merged with ChemChina, and BFS is like a little rubbish bin where they put all the anti, you know, everything to escape antitrust, you know, to come into that 50% level. But look at the mechanism of business that has been created out of this death machine. The glyphosate gives you cancer, and Bayer patents the cancer drugs. That is why we need to unify in our diversities as a movement to protect the earth, regenerate the planet, and regenerate our health 
and regenerate our freedom. And no matter what you do in the food system, the people you're up against is the rubber barons, the finance, the biotech, the IT. So earlier they said, without chemicals we'll starve, then they said GMOs, without GMOs we'll starve. Now they say, without big data we are going to starve. And what's big data? Big data is small information theft from farmers. They go to your farm and, and then take pictures of your farm, and then they consolidate all of this and sell it through your smartphone as a new commodity. They're calling this the new oil. Big data is the new oil. And the reason I know this is because just like the East India Company made us the experimental ground for that colonialism of extraction through rents, we are the place where the new colonialism through digital agriculture is being tested out. Now, right next to you in Silicon Valley, they created a climate data corporation, Monsanto bought it. A soil data corporation, Monsanto bought it. In my book, Oneness Versus One Percent, I've quoted the Monsanto person saying, we need farming without farmers because by getting rid of farmers, we have new markets for surveillance, robotic, and artificial intelligence. The farmer's real intelligence comes in the way. The farmer producing real food is coming in the way. I won't go into too much detail about how it is working because you can read the reports on the Navdanya International website, the two reports, The Future of Our Daily Bread, and the other is called the future of food. And in the future of food, I've addressed the new threats we face. So agriculture is not an activity that must get you into debt. It's not an activity in which you lose. My mother became a refugee when Pakistan was created, and she was in a high educational service, but she said, well, I've done all the work in government. I've broken every gas ceiling. And now I'll do what is the most meaningful work in life. I will be a farmer. My mother chose to be a farmer. For her, it was the highest vocation that she could choose as a refugee. To be a farmer means to care for the earth to nourish with real food. So the two big assaults that are coming are fake food and fake economics, and fake knowledge, I would add. So the fake knowledge is replacing real intelligence, ecological intelligence, emotional intelligence, cooperative intelligence of communities at work, including the intelligence in the plants, the intelligence in the microbes, the intelligence of the bacteria in our gut, it, we are super intelligent. Life is intelligence. And they want to say artificial intelligence with some of our narrow programs that are very mechanical, downloaded into a machine, and machine learning is artificial intelligence that will get rid of the farmer on the farm. We've got to say no. We will stay on the farm. We will not only retain our intelligence, but through our grandmothers, enhance it. Through co-creation and co-partnership with our plants, with the animals, with the microbes, enhance it. I mentioned the fake economics of zero budgeting. Look out for it. When you see the term zero budget, be suspicious. It's about externalizing costs. Our studies have shown that farmers in the industrial system, where it's industrialization of production and industrialization of distribution, through the Walmarts and the Amazons and the big supermarket chains, the farmers do not receive more than 1 to 4% of the value. And that's the case for coffee, too. It's only when they do direct distribution 
that you can have a chance of a fair price. And Navdanya farmers are earning 10 times more than the commodity farmers. We don't measure yield of nutritionally empty toxic commodities. We measure health per acre and nutrition per acre. And we can feed two times India's population. I know if we all, if, if we have to move from the fringes to the center, And if all farming was done as organic, it doesn't mean all the land that's un being wasted under industrial agriculture was made organic. Most of that land should not be under agriculture anyway. The Amazon should not be under GMO soya bean. The Midwest can go back to the prairies. If 80% come, food comes from small farms, we need much less acreage. And that lower acreage can be managed with a lot of care. The externalities we've assessed in India with chemical farming for just harm to farmers and harm to this environment is $1.3 trillion annually. I would imagine if we add health costs of the cancers and the autism and diabetes and infertility and antibiotic resistance, <coughs> we are talking of a shadow economy of industrial agriculture that's bigger than the formerly counted economy. The shadow is bigger. Except that this shadow makes money. It continues to make money. So we need a true cost accounting. We need living economies. We need circular economies. And I know that's the way each of you is creating this other food system. Finally, the big assault. That's again coming right here from Silicon Valley. You, you, you're in a very, very primary location for the new colonization. At that time, the people... For example, in England, the 300 merchant adventurers were all rascals. The good thing is, in the colonizing heartland, there are many people who are in solidarity with the earth, her species, colonized cultures of the past, and the colonized cultures of the present, and the colonized cultures of the future. We are all future colonies, all of us. So when land was colonized, the jurisprudence that was created was terra nullius. The land is empty. If they aren't white Christians, they're not people. You can exterminate them. They're impediments to human progress. Their culture are an impediment of our empire over lesser creatures of the earth. Boyle from New England, the governor. That's how they thought. And then when in that meeting of 87, which led me to seed saving and starting Navdanya, and they were trying to create intellectual property right on seed, I said, they want to create an empire over life. And this is bio -nullius. They declare life as empty. They declare the seed as empty. They declare indigenous knowledge as not knowledge, to then be pirated and patent. That's why I talked about biopiracy fought cases against biopiracy of neem, basmati, wheat, 1,500 climate-resilient patents by stealing the seeds we have saved. We have saved climate-resilient seeds that can tolerate salt, that can tolerate floods, that can tolerate droughts. And all they do is do a petty, pathetic genomic mapping and make a guesswork which part of the genome might be contributing to that property. No breeding, no care, no knowledge, casino. We will not allow life to be put on a casino like you put our finances on the casino in 2008 and destroy the economy. <laughs> Fake food is the next big desperate attempt to try and extinguish our movement. They're scared of the organic movement. We are not too big, but they're scared. They're scared because we carry another science, which is in the principles of ecology. We carry another economy, which is in the principles of, principles of giving back in circular economies. We are a threat because in spite of the fact that we shouldn't have existed, we are here. So, you know, we've been having fake food from the time of high fructose corn syrup and all the chemicals they make. I once visited Caltech and they took me to the food technology and I said, what do you do in food technology? Uh, and it's basically we make chemicals <laughs> to fool the brain. 
to make you think you're eating strawberry when you're not eating strawberry. To make you think you're eating vanilla when you're not eating vanilla. Today, this has reached the ultimate with an impossible burger launched here. And who's investing in it? The same venture capital and the same buyers. Who's Monsanto? This is what Mr. Writer of Bayer says. And you know, we talked of plant biodiversity. We talked of vegetables. And we used to talk of vegetarianism. And now suddenly there's this fashion of plant-based, not plants, but extraction from plants. And Mr. Writer from Bayer says, in order for plant-based companies, which I would just say fake food companies, uh, to produce at scale and succeed, they require efficient sources of amino acids and carbohydrates, not food. Hmm? Amino acids and carbohydrates, which will bring them around to raw crops that can be tilled and cultivated by machine. So our model of agriculture will be sustained by fake food. And they're doing all this to stop real food from reaching people's tables. They're doing this to prevent organic farmers from becoming the alternative. And then suddenly I found there's another, you know, a lot of young people who are doing these startups on cow-free milk and cow-free dairy. I know the Strauss dairy is here. I'd any day have real milk if I have to drink milk. The latest was a dear friend of mine, an ecologist, wrote an essay, and I've done a response. It's in the Ecologist magazine um, of this last round. And he says, we will not save the planet, we will not be able to protect the climate unless we get rid of the last farmer, which is exactly what Monsanto is saying, and make food through microbes in giant vats through genetic engineering. Yeah. And he calls it farm-free food as a rescue for the planet. <laughs> I have written in my piece that this is perpetuating the eco-apartheid of separating us from nature, separating cultures from their land, uprooting people and making us all refugees on the earth. We cultivate oneness. We cultivate the memory and the practice that we are part of the earth and not separate from her. We cultivate love for nature and humanity and the future. We cultivate truth because what we are governed by is not just poisons, but an entire empire of falsehoods to keep these poisons in place and keep telling lies, both about avoiding responsibility for harm and exaggerating the benefits. Gandhi called non-cooperation with falsehoods and violence, satyagre, the force of truth. Satya, truth, agre, the force. Our work is a permanent satyagre for life. Every day, every moment. A satyagre for the life of the land, for the life of the farmers and the community, and the life of the amazing gut microbiome, which is where our health begins. We cultivate hope, hope in a future, hope with the recognition that the biggest solution to climate change is not to say, eat bad food and fake food and kill yourself through that, but become part of the healing of the earth by returning organic matter to the soil. Our studies have shown that in 20 years, we have increased organic matter 100%. Nitrogen in the soil, 100%, while in the chemical farms, it's depleting. Chemical agriculture is 50% of the greenhouse gas problem, chemical industrial farming. Ecological agriculture and regenerating local food systems is a 100% solution, not just to the climate havoc, but to hunger, to disease. We cultivate freedom from the freedom of the seed, the freedom of the soil microbes, the microbes in our gut, and the freedom of a living earth with all her diversity. We should stop calling ourselves producers of food because that's a byproduct of something much bigger that we do. We care for the earth. We generate her health. We regenerate the health, 
social health of our communities through social justice, and the ecological health of each of our children through making their fundamental right to life real through the right to good food and real food, which can only come from real farms and real intelligence and real love and real giving. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.